when they arrested me, I felt shocked, dazed, and confused because I had no idea what was going on. I had assault rifles being pointed at me from every direction. They didn't tell me why I was being arrested, but they did tell me that if I made one wrong move, they'd blow my effing head off. I was arrested, taken to jail, and thrown into the hole. I was absolutely shocked. I eventually learned that I was being charged with murder. In my naive state, I thought, as soon as you go to court, this will be cleared up. But boy, was I wrong. My name is Timothy James Young. I am a wrongfully convicted prisoner on St. Quentin's death row. I have been here for 23 years, and I am an exoneree in the making. When Anthony Wolfe came forward, I think it was a real convenient thing. Uh, Anthony Wolfe had a tremendous bias, interest, and motive to lie. He came forward because he wanted to get out of doing some time himself. So he made a deal with the DA. They let him out of prison so he could come here and, and, and accuse the, the young brothers of, of committing these murders. He said he was with them, he had a shotgun, but he didn't shoot anybody, of course. He, he admitted that he was lying on the stand. Oh yeah, I lied about that yesterday. I mean, it went on and on. I mean, that's why this trial is coming back mainly, because uh, he was incredible. He was a pathological liar. Couldn't believe a word he said. There are so many red flags with this guy. You know, I can't see how they overlooked him. This guy shouldn't have been testifying. He gave so many different versions of things to police, almost as if they were coming back because something he said before couldn't quite work, and then he'd alter it to kind of make it work. Every story was different, every single time. Um, you know, he went in the bar first, then he walked in third, then he walked in second. Two people had a gun, no, we all three had a gun. I mean, it constantly changed. Over 45% of all wrongful capital convictions, that is all the innocent people who ended up on death row about whom we know, we're there because of a lying, compensated informant. It's an enormous problem. Tell anybody else this. Be careful of my quote here, but they had the most god awful evidence room. When we went through the the, the um, release of evidence in the books, there were things that were checked out four and five times. Which you say, it sounds like no big deal, except they were never checked back in between the four or five times. Detectives would come in, they take it out, they go do something, bring it back, no log in. It was just a nightmare. Things sometimes can be misplaced or lost or destroyed when it, when it wasn't supposed to be destroyed. I mean, you know, if there was anything that I was called out on, you know, I'm human. The officer and the technician didn't want to admit uh, that mistakes were made, but ev evidence handling in this case was horrendous. And to me then to come back and white out and change dates so you can show something was in, something, you know, um, I believe that was a cover up.
I, I believe that was a cover-up. The person or people um, charged with the custody and care of this evidence can't tell you um, where certain pieces of evidence were during what time. During that time, DNA samples were collected. It's entirely conceivable that items of evidence were cross-contaminated with DNA samples that were collected. It's also possible that DNA was intentionally planted on these items of evidence. And uh, the DA tried to make it look like it wasn't as bad as it was. Everybody agreed it was terrible, but it was a hairy moment there. I thought, oh God, this whole thing is going to just blow up in our face. It was a it was a, a sloppiness in the evidence room issue. It's not my decision to make whether it's sloppy or not. That's a jury decision. I, I finally threw my hands up at the end of that week and I said, that's what we're going to do. I wish the judge would have just done the right thing and excluded these pieces of evidence from the jury consideration. When he came to Hanford High as a freshman, I was a sophomore. We just clicked after that. That was my best friend right there. That was my brother. Tim is a friend, but also for me, he's always been a big supporter. He like sees so much good in people. The only way we could talk is over the phone. So I haven't seen him in over 20 years. It's my writing that allows me to reach the outside world and let the outside world know my thoughts and my opinions and to let them know that I'm human. Tim is, you know, one of my best friends. He's one of my closest friends. He has friends. inspired me to be doing anything, I mean, try to do anything to help He him. is incredibly empathetic. He's a kindness. He's a great artist. Uh, he's a great activist. You know, he dreams along a revolutionary spectrum. I am more than a prison number. I am more than the preconceived notions that accompany my skin. I am more than subjugation. I am more than a wrongful conviction. I am more than a stereotype, a stigma, a statistic. What I am is resistance. 23 years of resilience, and still I stand. I started as a seedling. Solidarity kept me breathing, achieving, believing deliverance would come. My prophecies, they came true. My premonitions, they came true. I am more than a man forsaken. I am an exoneree in the making.